So um, H2O is building um, better predictions. Uh, it's focused on building a math engine in the open source and bring um, really state-of-the-art distributed better algorithms for big data and in a very classic approachable way. Um, we are, if you love math and you want to change the world, we are also hiring. So if you're, if you're fun with math or systems hackers, you're looking for a QA, white box, testers, people who love numbers. Um, and the impact of math is actually substantial. We are seeing traction across different different verticals, even verticals we've not talked thought about, or parts of open source, free for cancer research. We want to solve the problem before it solves us. And, um, and, and stuff like that. So we're really a very uh, young startup, a big data startup, well-funded, but our focus is to be a big intellectual legacy. That Hadoop is a massive opportunity, and there's not enough data scientists. So wasting data science, scientist time is like wasting real, 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 real like, renovate your world. The world never had enough mathematicians at any given time. It doesn't have enough of them today as well. And that's kind of why, uh, that's the focus of this, um, this era we're in, building tools so the life, day in the life of the data science gets better. And eventually we don't expect data analysts or business analysts to ever code. And so we want to make sure there's not a lot of, um, lot of math reduce being learned at the higher levels. We would rather have mathematicians get closer to business and solve real domain problems. Um, at the highest level, what we do can be described in three pieces, exploration, modeling, and scoring. And exploration is mostly about ad hoc exploration. That's where the language piece comes in. Modeling is mostly about um, math. And so that's where our key focus for the company and the product has been. And and, and real-time scoring is kind of the uh, where velocity comes into play. So our, at the highest speeds, we are building uh, better exploration through R. So you can actually use your existing API like R and Python and JSON uh, to drive our product. And we are working with messy data, trying to help with missing elements and bring better data uh, exploration at the upfront. We're munging, day-to-day -day munging, moving between tools, moving between different Unix consoles and MapReduce jobs. That's kind of where we want to actually give you a very easy experience, one single tool. And then um, further, we have focused on building very good high-scale regression algorithms, classification algorithms, and clustering algorithms. You're going to see Random Forest, which is one of the key uh, classification that we have uh, that has taken a lot of our engineering. We have a very good implementation that will ask you to try it and see how it solves your problems. Um, fundamentally, the real problem here is to how do you solve unbalanced data sets? How do you actually make sure you can find the needle in the haystack when the haystack has gotten so big? Lastly, we actually are also building optimization for one of our customers. So that's also part of our roadmap. We want to give you the full end to end math modeling toolkit that you can take to any size data sets and any size machines. Um, and scoring, which is actually kind of the low latency element of the space, where you want to take these models and put them in production and make them still go very fast. Right? So that low latency is kind of the part. So you can do hundreds of these models in a very, very um, quick fashion. So there's no one model for all of your data universe, and we want you to be able to use multiple models. And that's the only way to do that is your score engine is really fast. And so that's kind of, we have a 100 nanosecond scoring engine that embeds into whatever system that your production systems are. And so you can actually take that to production. So you build your models, your offline scoring gets as good as your online scoring. So you can, you have more confidence taking your modeling to, to, the, to the market. So we have a fantastic team that puts all these three together, very different pieces. One of them dealing with language, other dealing with data and math, and then low latency. All this without forcing a net new API. We don't want the world to learn. There's enough languages already, and it's going to be a polyglot world, so let's embrace it. We will take your languages and then make them scale. So in some sense, R, we, we have a future for where fast R project that Jan is also doing. Um, that now takes our input and scales it on bytecode that we, we have as Java. Um, the other big piece that has been of concern is, is more data better or better algorithms better. And um, different camps in, this, in the valley as well and across in New York. Um, one of the things that we, we want to stump is 
you don't have to do make a choice. You get more data and better algorithms. Right? So you take the best latest algorithm. So we are actually one of the one of the future roadmap pieces. We have GBM that we're taking, trying to scale it on big data. Um, other pieces we have, we have people who are fanatic about Boltzmann machines and stuff like that. So we are trying to take these new latest greatest algorithms and apply them at scale. So it's not just more data or better algorithms, go get them both and solve the problems. And, and so, so the real real key piece is not necessarily algorithms, it's the next step. How do you discover insights in your data? Finally, we don't we're not yet another big data startup trying to make money. We are trying to leave an intellectual legacy. We, we, we really believe that math needs to be free. And it's tens of thousands of years of evolutionary um, knowledge. And that needs to be a platform that anybody can access and build, get better tools and applications on top of the core math platform. And that's why we are, um, we are actually a very open source company and, and we, we want to build a great community as well as um, community of users, developers, extenders, build applications, we want to support you guys um, to go use the map. One of the fundamental discovery, one of the shocking discovery that we had as a company was there's not enough math being used in the businesses, in the enterprises in the world. And that's something we're, we're out to change. We're trying to evangelize and going to all these meetups, talking directly to end users is some of the <coughs> core philosophies we have picked up. And we are trying to evangelize the use of better math and use of better technologies for solving your day-to-day -day problems. And and so that's we, we I mean uh, GitHub is open. We are we are going to make it it's Apache V2 license. We expect people to eventually go, go and become part of Apache Software Foundation. But we want to make sure we get to high velocity before we get into the communities. Um, it's a fantastic team, we are hiring, um, but our team of uh, very solid systems engineers, but also um, very good, um, um, <coughs> very good data science advisor, um, Stephen Boyd, Trevor Hasty, and Rob Tipsharani. And we're going to the source. So whoever has invented the technology, the, the algorithm, you're going to them straight and asking them what are the better ways to do it. How do you guys take your uh, Fortran implementation so it scales better? How do we take that and apply it for a very highly unbalanced data set? And that's kind of the real heart of the problem is how do we take this uh, great algorithms in R and, and implementations in R and make them widely accessible to a great audience. And that's kind of um, one of the core pieces behind it. So Random Forest is an algorithm that was uh, devised originally by Leo Breiman and Adele Kotler a few years back. It synthesizes a number of ideas that were floating in the community. And um, you know, we'll start by introducing a few of the key concepts uh, so you can understand the rest of the talk. And I'll, you know, I'll try to be as self-contained as possible. Uh, so starting with the beginnings, uh, we'll start by describing what is a classification tree. So imagine you have a very simple data set. It's composed of red and green dots. And they are living on a plane to the surface with coordinates in x ranging from 1 to 4 and y from 5 to 8. Okay? Simple enough. And imagine that the goal uh, we set ourselves is given a new observation Pick a color. Is it going to be red or green? Simple, right? And if you look at the board, you know, some patterns may emerge. It's not completely random. So how are we going to decide uh, what our color to assign to our new observation? Well, one way to do this is uh, to, be, uh, to build a classification tree. So for instance, here is one that I'll build for you. And basically, this tree says things like this. If, um, if your x-axis is, so let's start at the root, is larger than 3, and your y-axis is larger than 6, that's this corner, you're going to get red. And basically, what the tree does is it describes, you know, the, this, this chessboard in fine granularity so that every point, you know, every 
point is, uh, is identified by some leaf node in the tree and all the leaf nodes have a single color and therefore now if I come with a new observation I can just figure out in which node it will fall and say ah, you know, it's red. Okay, easy enough. So another way to visualize the tree is to think of the tree as painting the surface with these colors and wherever you land in the 2D space this is the color you will get okay? now the obvious thing is you, the, the first thing that comes to mind when you think about it a little bit is that you know this is just one small sample of the population and you know, this, this painting here doesn't quite match our intuition if you go back one thing you know our intuition if you look at this from a distance is roughly that these squares are red, these squares are green, roughly said. But if you look at the painting, you know you have this whole band here that shows up as green. So what we're doing is we're overfitting the little data we had to generate you know, this classifier. All right, so the idea of random forest is really simple. It's, you know, you start with the original population, and to avoid overfitting, you're going to build many trees, but many partial trees, many trees that are kind of wrong. But the idea is, you know, if you put lots of people who are kind of wrong together, you get American democracy or you get <laughs> uh, uh, a random forest algorithm. So, uh, let's see. So, how do we do this? Well, we take, with our, take our original population and then we are going to sample it, get subsets of that original population and for each of those subsets, so these are two subsets they are slight, they are overlapping, right, they can have the same observations and for each of those subsets we're going to build ourselves a tree using exactly the same approach as before so here's a tree for one subset and here's a tree for another subset and the interesting thing about those trees is there will be points where they disagree you know this this point here uh, I'm, I'm saying that things that are uh, in that corner uh, let's see larger than three uh, larger than three smaller than, larger than two larger than six so I forget what, what I was doing but there will be points which which disagree why because you have different you know, different populations and, um, ah yes, this square for instance in this tree has only a green dot so it's a safe assumption that you'll classify this space as green whereas this square happens to have only red dots so it's a safe assumption that you'll classify this as red but the thing is that by randomizing and seeing only some small part of the population we are going to create a combined classifier that it performs better. So the parts where the three agree, we're really sure about. The parts where they disagree, you know, it's you know, it's up for grabs. Okay. So there are a couple more things to introduce about a random forest. So this concept of um, of taking random samples is called bagging. Uh, Basically, the idea is each tree will be built on a different subset of the population that you take without replacement from the original. And then, and that's a very simple thing. And then the second concept is uh, how do I grow my trees? Well, I'll grow my trees by at each node selecting. Uh, the split, this value of one of the feature that best separates my population. And you have different criteria, such as Gini or information gain, which you can <coughs> pick up to, the, uh, to, to do this. And then you keep on growing the trees until either you hit a limit or you get leaf nodes that are you know, uniform in one population. Um, then, once you have a set of trees, what the way you use them is 
for each new observation, you will simply vote. You will say, I have this new point, I'll classify it with which trees, and I'll pick, you know, if 60% say red, I'll say red. Simple enough. Um, so there's a couple more, more small things to talk about. One is um, the notion of error. So Breiman had this very elegant way to evaluate the quality of a forest. This is what he called out-of-bag error. And basically the idea is as follows. Each time we build a tree, so we pick a sample of the population and we're going to use that sample to build a tree. What we're going to do is remember all the observations we did not use to build that tree and use those observations to evaluate that particular tree. So you have 100 tree, they're built with 100 samples, and they're evaluated with 100 complements of those samples. So for instance, if I build a tree with this, this sample, and I evaluate it with this one, I'll get most likely errors around here, because here I only saw green and the complement has red, and here because uh, I only saw red and there was a green dot. Okay? So out of bag error is this error estimate that you can use without any special data. You can use it, uh, you can create an estimate using the same data you use to train and build your model. And lastly, how do we know what, how well we're doing? Well, at the end of the day, you will have a validation set, say, and you will build yourself a confusion matrix of this kind, which says, well, you know, I've predicted uh, that 15 observations were red, but, uh, you know, there were f uh, and five greens, uh, and this is your assigned versus actual. And this gives you a notion of, you know, this, in this one I have 33% of errors on this class, and here I have 10% error. All right. Any questions? That's a quick whirlwind seven minute tour of what random forest is about. Okay. So, uh, what we could do is just show you how it runs. Yes? How do you combine the trees? How do we combine the trees? So we have a bunch of trees and we just um, classify observation with each tree and then you vote. And then you can set the, the voting criteria to what, value, what percentage you want. So for instance, in some cases you may be interested if, you know, if you know, the typical thing would be 50%. But you may be interested in cases where there's even a small chance that, you know, something is of a particular class. So you can set the threshold. Make sense? Right. So how do you deal in with the uh, mission variable? Aha! So uh, the question is how to deal with missing observations. Well, there's, um, there's two, th two things to, that we worry about missing observation. When we build the trees, and then when we valid, when we classify, and uh, so a couple of options. You could throw away the rows, but that's in practice really bad because a lot of data sets have a lot of missing observations. But it's if you have a data set that has many features, it may turn out that you actually never visit the missing observation. So what you could do is say, well, you know. If I get a, if I actually try to use a missing observation, I'll throw away the row. Another thing you could do is, if I try to use a missing observation while I traverse a tree, just randomly pick left or right. You could be more clever and say, well, I'll use the distribution of values in that column. You know, there's, there's a number of things. In our current implementation, we just randomly pick. Okay? Yeah? Um, sorry if I missed this. Uh, do you also randomly sample while you're building the tree that are built on random subsets of the available features? Ah, yes, I didn't mention that, but yes, the, that is that is the other that is another you know, part. So each time each time we we look at the split, we're only evaluating a subset of the features, and I'll come back to that in a in a later slide because it has how many you pick actually has an impact on quality of your results. 
essentially this is a, so using the same kind of command that we saw earlier. Simple one jar file, one of the things I asked the team to help is to make it very easy to deploy. I bootstrap the company teaching Hadoop, so I don't want anybody to teach this to or how to install it. It should be that simple to install. So it's a very simple, easy to install product that um, clusters give it like five characters. What we're seeing and then if you want on the main page is a simple tutorial, which includes uh prime and forest tutorial. So if we there's a data so this connects you to the wiki page so you can actually learn more about it. Um, so there is a data ingest piece where you can import from a URL <coughs> HDFS. Uh, in this particular case, we'll import from HDFS. Let's get us back by S3. You can actually look at some data sets here. Uh, cow type is the world's most popular, um, or our most popular data set for doing random forest. Can it give a general separator here? Get a quick summary of your data. Get a quick summary of the data. Um, min, max, missing, mu, sigma, kind of. It's just, this data set is um, doing forest coverage type. So, trying to predict on response rate of 54. So, so it's it's 10, 10 or you know, 20, 20 trees will see the impact of the number of trees later. <laughs> So one of the things you try to do is to optimize the number of trees in the traditional R implementations. And, um, so, yeah. so cough type has about 500,000 rows, roughly. Half a million. Yeah. And here, the sorry, we're building the trees incrementally. Yeah. Sorry. We're building the trees incrementally. <coughs> and as we build the tree, we're building the OOB estimate. So what you, what you are seeing here is the OOB estimate with only part of the trees built. And the page will refresh as we get more trees. The classification error, so this is the aggregate classification error, which sounds at 30%, and that's pretty bad, typically decreases. In this particular case, it's so fast. It's on 16 machines, so it's finished very fast. So we can rerun more. Right. And so if you add trees, you will get a better result. And that's sort of the general principle of random forest, right? Is that putting more of those weak classifiers together, together gives you better prediction abilities. So, uh, so now, now we're running it with 400. And, um, oh, it's done. Oh. So usually on, on my laptop, it takes a minute or two. I have time to talk through it. Um, Let's get more bigger data. Bigger data? All right. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah, sure. So what are the chances of increasing overfitting by generating many, many more trees? So generating many, many more trees would uh, not necessarily increase overfitting because each one is built on a distinct subset. So, so you don't, none of them sees the whole data. So they're all sort of wrong. Okay. Now what happens is after a while adding trees doesn't help anymore. So and depending on your data set, you'll see there the curve of how many trees or what's the contribution of each tree changes. Um, do you guys have visualizations so that you can see convergence? Uh, not at uh, not not right now. So this is the uh, this is the current. So so we have two APIs. One which is the web API, and the other one is an R console that we're in the process of building. And I think we will put some of some more smarts in the console once we have it. Um, one simple question. Yeah. So uh, for each member to use job, right? are you building one layer of the tree or just build a single tree? Wait for a little bit. I'll tell you all that. Okay. All, all that thought. Yeah. Did you show the confusion matrix or cover type? What was the overall accuracy on so, the uh, So he switched. So he t t yeah. So typically, uh, the one we had for 10.3 was 30%. Was 
which is quite awful, and you can get all the way to 4% with more trees and tweaking things a bit, and I'll mention that. You should be able to get better than 90% accuracy. Well, 4% 4, 4 is the number of errors. Oh, so, I see. So, so switch it. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So which one are we doing now? I'm just learning while it's parsing the big data. Okay, so we're doing several things at the, at the same time. So which, which, which what is the big data? Yeah. So the big data is all, all the years. Right, so the big data is the uh, airlines data, that's 12 gig. It's not a big, big data set, but you know, it's bigger than, than the others. Um, and uh, we're doing two things at, the, at once, building, building uh, 103, um, uh, 103 a cop type and parsing the, uh, the um, uh, airline data set. And it is probably going to take a little bit because the airline data set usually takes a little bit. We have to bring it from this, we have to read it a couple of times uh, and parse it. Did it finish? For the system gigs, we, we made sure there's enough stuff in there so people can actually monitor, manage, and cluster. But fundamentally, the goal is that the end math person <coughs> trying to look at whether the HTML is compatible with the network and TCP stack. Right, so what, but I, I think we, we've got the point. Let's go back to the top. So, yeah, so, so typically you get uh, confusions matrix like this. And if the trees are small, we can either print them graphically. Uh, it's a cute feature, but it, you know, in practice it's never used because the trees are big. Or we can generate Java or C code that encodes the tree that you can run, you can use to run this as a, uh, for classification and scoring. All right. So I said we uh, looked at some other tools. Uh, th there's a number of implementation of, of RF. Ours is distributed, but uh, we couldn't get any license to, for another distributed system. So here what we're doing is comparing the accuracy of different tools uh, on the single node uh, status. And there's a set of, you know, there's a few data sets. They go from here, you know, you've got the stats, but roughly said, these are tiny and these are small. So small means 100,000 to 500,000 rows. Tiny means, I don't care, it's just very small. Uh, and um, so we compared our implementation, the standard R implementation that uh, Ryman did, Weka and WiseRF. And for each of them, I show the, uh, I show the uh, error rate. So lower is better. You know, we want fewer errors. And the bold numbers are the uh, best for that particular data set. And well, you know, the, what can we say? Some, sometimes we've got the best results. Sometimes uh, we're, you know, not too far. Interestingly, for cough type, we get 3.6% uh, error, whereas R gets 22%. And that's a really big difference. I don't know why. It may be that R cuts the size of the trees. That's my best guess. There was a question. Are, are these all using the same C function for the random, any randomness that you're doing? Um, no. So the problem is sometimes we can, sometimes we can't. And the random number generators are different. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. Are the number of trees the same? Yes, yes. So, so all the other, you know, all the knobs we can play with are the same. Uh, and we try to get, for all the tools, the best possible results playing with different knobs to the best. I mean, all I'm claiming is in 2,000 or 3,000 lines of code, you get a competitive tool, right? You know, if you want to spend more time, you can do probably better. All right, so the interesting part, you know, for me as a computer scientist is, well, how do we build this thing? How do we build this, uh, this algorithm? Um, and, um, 
you know, especially since it's uh, for a distributed and parallel setting. So, so a couple of questions. So if, if your data set doesn't fit in one computer and you want to parallelize things, there's a couple of questions you have to answer. One of them is, well, uh, I said we're going to sample the data for each tree. So imagine I have 12 gigabytes. How do I create for 1,000 trees or 500 trees, 500 different samples of 12 gigabytes? Uh, how do I select the splits, the point at which we, uh, we perform, we, uh, we, we uh, separate the population? Um, how do I estimate the uh, out of bag error? Again, if, if I have to do this uh, on a very large set of uh, data observations and for many, many trees. Um, so we had a couple of insights, nothing terribly surprising. The first one is, uh, if your data fits in memory, then parallelizing this algorithm is really, really simple, right? Because you know all of this is very independent, so you can run on, on you can build your tree in parallel. You can have one thread per, you know, uh, per per leaf uh, that you're building, and it it works very nicely. Different trees can be built in parallel, again, trivially. Each tree is independent, so you can build them in parallel. Now, an interesting observation, which uh, we didn't think of at first, is that the tree size grows a lot. So, you have, essentially, the trees are describing all the nooks and crannies of your data. The more complex the data, the more you know, sort of nodes and branches. Um, so trivial data sets, small trees. Large data sets that encode a complex function. Remember, the uh, RF only you know, can say, oh, it's larger or smaller. So you're describing a function by a sequence of it's larger and you know, that's very, uh, a very coarse way to describe complex functions. So, if you have complex data and lots of data, your trees tend to become very large. Um, and lastly, if I want to validate a tree, you know, confuse my out of error, uh, out of bag error, I have to have the tree together with the data on the same computer. That's obvious. Well, that means now I have to ship, make sure trees are available on a cluster. All, right. All of these are things that are you know, worth thinking about when you design an algorithm like this. Um, so the strategy we, we, we picked is the following. We decided to say, well, what we'll do is we'll do a first step of randomization where we randomize the data over the cluster and each node has a view of a subset of the data and it works with that. So, if we're building a tree, we're going to build it node local on the subset of the data that is on that, on that node. And then, you know, we can build trees on parallel on all the nodes, and we, build, uh, we, can build, uh, we can build trees also in parallel within a node. And then, when we want to do validation, we're going to flood the network with trees. And these can be... Uh, you know, easily 100,000 of split nodes, so fairly large. Okay. So, what I'll do now is I'll just <coughs> step through some of the, the interesting parts of the algorithm and tell you how, how to do this. <coughs> so, you know, the first thing to note is we're not starting from scratch, we're building on top of the H2O in the infrastructure. And what H2O is good for is, is that it's, it's a good engine for doing distributed computations. So it has two things. It has an abstraction of key value pairs where values, where keys are unique strings and values are vectors that can span many, many nodes. So first abstraction. The other abstraction that it has is it has a distributed fork <coughs> join framework. So in Java, there is a notion of fork join framework for concurrency and we've added distribution to it. So we can distribute tasks uh, over 
the, the, uh, over uh, the, the cluster and parallelize them within a node. So the question of map reduce is addressed by a distributed framework. So distributed for join means I'm forking threads and the threads are migrated silently to different nodes and they run on those nodes and then they fork sub-threads that are running on that node. Okay? So one way to think about the H2O system in the long run is to think about it as an oper operating system for doing distributed mathematical computations. Okay? It has a store, it has you know, threads, it has resource management, it has all of this. So for the first bit, uh, how do I read and parse the data? Well, for me it was easy. I just delay, uh, um, defer that to the infrastructure. The infrastructure has a notion of value array, which is like an R data frame. And a value, value, array, has, value array has rows and columns. And it has a function to read a, a particular observation in the value array. The value array is chunked at four megabytes chunks. And the chunks are randomized over the network. So when I read a big file, 12 gigabyte file, that file is sprayed through the cluster in four megabyte units. So, um, so parsing is done, no code to write. Uh, extracting random subsets. So for extracting random subsets, the strategy we picked was to say, well, what we'll do is we will have a local cache of data and that local cache of data will be used, it will be built out of all of the chunks of, uh, of the uh, in, uh, input array that are node local. So this is done in less than a page here in uh, H2O. So we say, this is my data key. This is the name of the file I've parsed. I read it from the key value store. I get a value array. I create a, a, an array of jobs. And then for every four megabyte chunk that belongs to the value array, if it is located on the current node, I create a, uh, a job. And what the job is, is that it will read all the data in that value array and put it in my local cache. And then I invoke all my jobs. This runs in parallel and slurps in all the node local data in a representation that I find useful. Okay. One question, the cache is in memory or in HDL? So system? the caches uh, are in memory. And if the memory starts to, if there, uh, it starts to, to memory pressure start to increase, H2O will start to evict some of the, the chunks to disk. So silently, there is the Java garbage collector and the H2O memory manager. And the H2O memory manager talks to the Java gar garbage collector. And when it sees that memory is growing low, it starts to push stuff out. And if that's not enough, we die. Yeah? So the next interesting bit of the algorithm is um, how to split the data. And roughly, uh, the way it's described in the Breiman algorithm is I have this uh, sequence of values. So, for if, so the way it works is, remember, I'm building this decision tree. At each point in the tree, at each node, I have some part of the population, and I want to split it in left and right. So imagine that this is the subset I have at one particular node in the tree that I'm building. What is the best split? So the way Ryman describes it is first you sort the values by you know the feature you're looking at. So this is uh, you know sorting them them uh, in in order of increasing value, and then you find the best point where to split here, it's pretty obvious you want to split here, and you get a very nice red-green split. But that means sorting at every node in the tree. Um, and every node sees a different subset of the original sample they, it had, so there's not, not much you can do. And you can have all, 
over 100,000 nodes for a big data set. That's a lot of sorting. So what we do is uh, we turn the data, we discretize the data. So for every value in the original input, we turn it into consecutive numbers, one, two, three, four. And furthermore, if we want uh, some compaction, we will bin a number of consecutive value in the same, same number. And then what we do is, then we don't have to sort because we can just use an array and uh, store all those values, uh, think of the, those values as indices in, a, in an array. And the split function, which I will not detail, is this, not more than that. And it's basically one big loop over all the values, all the distinct values in your feature, and then a number of loops over the data, and you're done. No sorting, nothing. Just normal Java, easy to write. Yep. Uh, so is it possible to run into, I mean, because when you deal with the big data, yep. uh, probably you have uh, lots of, I mean, distinct values, such right. that it's going to run Then you can bin. You can right. aggregate a number of values into the same, 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 same discrete so, number at the cost of some precision. And, you know, the, the choice is, well, do I want a precision and speed uh, and, you know, decrease speed or, yeah. Do, do I try MDL? Sorry? Something like MDL, uh, MDL, I mean, or something like uh, minimum description. Yeah, minimal description, yes, something like that. Um, we so, didn't try anything more than this. Oh, this yeah. is as far as we got. Remember, not a data scientist, 2,000 lines of code. <laughs> it's a small budget and, you know, small brain. So, and the last bit to, to, that I want to mention is how do we parallelize the tree building? And there, it's a simple case of fork join. And you know, this is lots boring code, but essentially what you're doing is for each node, you're creating a left and right, and you are going to fork a thread for the left and a fork a thread for the right. Now, the fork join framework may not fork. It will choose whether it actually forks or not. But as far as the programmers go, you, know, you consider that you forked and you forget about it. And that's proper, probably all I have to say about the implementation. So while building this, we found a number of fun observations. One of them that uh, Java is a very, very you know, pleasant language to work with. It has lots of libraries. The libraries are very good. There is a random number generated class. And that random number isn't very random. Okay. Uh, and it showed up in surprising ways. We were getting bad uh, error rates, right? So it actually, so, so, so our, the quality of our result was like twice as worse as R. And this was just because our random number generator was returning sequences that were not that random. Oh, so we fixed, we, we implemented our own random number generator, then we realized that the, the sum random number generator is okay as long as the seed is really big. So, no, that's a good thing to know. Yeah. How big? Uh, basically, it has to be long, and you use you know enough of the bits. Uh, it's open source. You can look. There's a. We we. It's documented exactly how much we had to, to add. Um, Tree size gets to be a challenge. Big trees are hundreds of uh, kilobytes, hundreds of megabytes. So it's, a point, it's not 100 megabytes, it's up to a megabyte. If you have lots of them, it becomes a problem. Um, I said that we randomize by uh, spreading four megabyte chunks and using all the chunks that are on the node. But that means our randomization is only at four megabytes boundaries, which is not great. And that's an engineering thing which we should just fix, randomize uh, much better. And then last thing to, you know, that's as a message for anybody building things like that, build the algorithm so it is deterministic. Yes, it's a random algorithm, but make it sure that you have a mode where you can repeat and get exactly the same result. So it's already hard enough the thing with statistics, you always get a number, 42. <laughs> a good number or a bad number? It's 42. I don't know. 
You ask the domain people, they'll tell you, oh, 42 is a great number, and I can give you an explanation why. You, say, you come a week later and say, actually, it was 24. Oh, no, yeah, I can give you an explanation why. Yes. So, really hard. Testing is important. So, last tiny bit of, of this talk uh, is um, we played a little bit with the knobs of the algorithm. And um, this is just telling you which nodes are interesting and worth looking at. So we have these data sets. This is about cough type, which is um, describing forests. Um, as I said, we have 500,000 rows, and typically we use 300,000 for model building and 200,000 for validation. So the first thing we did was we varied the sampling rate. So this is from 0 to 100. And the sampling rate is how much of the observation do I use to build each tree, right? And it's a, it's a valid question. How much should I use, right? Could use 1%, and then I get errors that are really high. Or I could, could use 100%. And for cop type, it seems that the more I use, the more my the blue line is the validation error, the, the better I get results. But it's not the true case for all, 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 all uh, data sets. And the red line here is the out of bag error. And uh, it's sort of interesting that as you use, you have more and more of your, your, um, your data that is used to build each tree, the out of bag error becomes meaningless. And why? Well, because it has so few observation that it becomes very chaotic. But the rest of the curve, they follow each other fairly nicely. So the out of bag error is a good predictor of your actual error. So the other thing we played for was, so somebody asked about this number of feature per split. So the algorithm, each time it evaluates a split, doesn't look at the whole set of feature, but only a subset. And how many of them you pick matters. So here, what we're showing is blue is our uh, classification error. And we show, this shows, this is the error rate. This is um, the number of features you use. So cough type has 50 features. So we can use from one feature all the way to 50. And this, the different lines are for different sampling rates. But let's take the, the bottom one. The bottom one is for an 80% sampling rate. So you see that as I increase the number of feature, my error decreases. And then around you know, 30 or so, which is about half, I get the best result. And then it, 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 it becomes worse. And what this sort of suggests is, you know, again, overfitting. right? You see too much of the data, I'm overfitting. Another fun thing to do with cough type is you can drop out certain features completely. And you see that, for instance, so this is, these are the feature numbers, and this is the impact of dropping one of them. So if I drop feature 0, my error goes to 8%. So worse error. That feature is really useful. But if I drop out feature 1, my error goes back to 4.5%. 4, 4 so feature 1 is actually confusing your algorithm, right? So the more data doesn't mean the better results. <coughs> All right. So coming to the end, so what did we see? We saw random forest, cool, powerful machine learning algorithm. My claim is it's actually easy to write a distributed and parallel implementation if you have the right tools. Right? It's not that hard. It took a couple of months to get it right, but uh, you know. If I had to do it again, it'd be a couple of weeks. Um, different implementation choice are definitely possible. So the way we're building things, you know, we're doing this siloing of the data per node. That is just a choice. And you know, whether it performs better or not than some other implementation, that remains to be evaluated. Uh, and you know, for us, I think we want to scale to terabyte data, you know, to see whether because uh, it, it's it's very likely that when you scale up. The current approach won't work. It's just too much data. The trees will be too big. So what do we do? Um, you know, I don't know. We need to actually see real data to be able to tell. 
that's pretty much all I had to say for today. Thank you for your attention. Any questions? Or no? So the models, the trees, are stored as key-value pairs in the in the cloud key-value store, and you can any node can request them by providing the key for that model. And that's, by that you mean for each for each tree. For each tree, but what for what if and I guess it was. And there is then there is an aggregate for the whole forest. Yes. So. If you're a fan of programming languages, why didn't you use Scala instead of Java? It would be 200 lines instead of 2,000. And it would be two times slower, but who cares about performance? No, uh, Scala, I just, you know, Scala is a wonderful language. Spent six months with Martin Odersky uh, about seven years ago, previous sabbatical. Uh, it is a language that dangerously pushes the limit of human understandability in its type system. Um, I work with R. R has no types. I find that, you know, useful and handy. And so I don't know. I, it's just familiarity. It was a question here. How many more lines of code to do RF-based regression instead of classification? Right. Uh, so regression we haven't implemented, and our belief is not that hard. But uh, this is. You know you, the usual thing in computer science. Yeah, that feature, no problem. Two years later, oh well. <laughs> yeah. So I guess my question is kind of in two parts. Can you give us a sense, um, given how much data uh, data is on a single node, how much memory footprint is being used, like what the ratio is? And number two, given the size of a data set, how much computing resources do I need uh, to, okay. to train? with your implementation of a random yeah, yeah, yeah. So the two questions were, how much memory, you know, if I have, let me rephrase that, if I have one gigabyte of memory per node, how much heap do I need to provision for the Java VM? So that's roughly or or how much, uh, uh, what is the limit in the size of uh, the data that can be processed? On well, the limit is clearly how many gigabytes of RAM you have. And we, we typically we require about, say, twice 2.5 as much heap as the data. Okay, so you know we're running on 500 gigabyte heaps, that, but you know that tends to be expensive. The other question was the speed at which, it would, you know, given a data set, let's say it's you know 100 gigs. Um, how many? Uh, how many nodes? How many nodes do I need? What, what does the configuration have to look like? So, usually we have run. You know, so it depends on what you have, right? So we have run with uh, 16 cores, 10 gig nodes, and you know, for 100 gigs, it'll be probably in the 20s or so. Depends because um, we compress the data as we parse it. So the 100 gigs may end up being much smaller, if we're lucky. Uh, and the other thing is the complexity of the data is going to drive a lot of the speed and, and space cost. So imagine that your, all of your observations are completely different. There is no redundancy. Then your tree will be the size of your, your you know, have as many leaves as, as rows. Not good, right? But the hope is that we're looking for patterns and that we can collapse things. And this is, you know, this is the interesting question of how far can we? And what we've seen is up to now it, that the bigger the data set, the bigger the trees, and the bigger the trees, the more accurate. So whenever we cut down on tree size by imposing a limit, we lose on accuracy. And that, that becomes a very hard problem, right? Because you really like that accuracy, but it costs. And you know, that's a trade-off that depends on what your end goals are and your data set is. So the I, I you know the depth or just the number of nodes. You could have a very deep single line tree, which would be fine. It's the number of leaves that matters for uh, 
process to the process the data to cut down the separation factor? Um, whether we're building uh, facilities to cut down the branching factor. So one of the things we're doing is by binning some of the values, we're sort of decreasing the number of distinct observables and that will decrease your branching factor at the cost of precision. And that's the only thing we've come up with so far. And there's one question back. Yeah, I, I want to um ask about your observation that the larger the data set, the more the trees, the larger the trees. Yeah. Um, my understanding is that one of the trade-offs that you're allowed or that allowed to do is you can have weaker classifiers, so smaller trees, yeah. but just have a lot, lot more of them. Well, uh, so, so, yeah. So, so yeah, I can speak to that a little bit. So the, the question is, well, wouldn't it be just better to say have small trees but millions? And the problem with that is often since, it depends on your data set, but imagine that your data set has many features. The likelihood at the top of the tree, none of those features will select very well. So you will pick random features and they'll cut the population in half randomly without really increasing the information content in each of the partition. And it's only when you start to go down to smaller sets that you start picking up information. So my intuition is that artificially cutting down the depth of the tree really, really hurts you, especially for large data sets. I, and I don't have a good answer because it sucks. Long, larger trees are really expensive. Yeah. Those accuracy numbers that you showed, was that Genie or InfoGain? And do you have any so InfoGain, Genie didn't, uh, InfoGain was better than Genie pretty much in all our data sets. Not by much, but yeah. Since I had it implemented InfoGain, I kept that one and threw out the other. <laughs> Did you do any variable importance? Can you display variable? Um, so we haven't implemented that. It's you know easy, easily done, close the 2000 line budget, I think. <laughs> so what would happen if one of the nodes failed to retrieve? Ha, good question. So H2O is an operating system that is not yet fault tolerant. So currently, uh, if you lose a node, it's just like you lose a little bit of your RAM. Bad things happen. Um, you know, we, we have plans to make things more fault tolerant, but it's unclear that the extra costs, the costs are worth it. So a lot of our computations are done in matters of minutes. And the feeling is, you know, if we can keep, you know, down to minutes, then just rerun the thing with fewer nodes. If we get to the point where you're running 24-7 with one cloud that stays up, that's a different proposition. Um, you know, different engineering choices will have to be made. Uh, yeah. Do you try to uh, do you try to uh, do the regression type? Uh, I mean, regression type tree, regression type. No, we don't do that yet. Oh. Yeah, it doesn't mean regression, but part yeah. instead of. Oh, part. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, no, we uh, haven't implemented it. Well, part large roadmap. It's, uh, as Sri said, it's part of our roadmap. Uh, my sabbatical is ending, that'll be, you know, his problem. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was going to point to yeah. the airline you said, which we finished short of course, but continue with the community. Yeah, any other questions? As you can tell, um, Jan picked up the grand applause. So yeah, two and a half years ago, I remember distinctly on University Avenue running into Jan, uh, who was presenting at Stanford, um, and said, Jan, I, I can't run the random forest in R, it's just too damn slow. And well, sure enough, he, he kept his word and came and joined me to, on his sabbatical and built a fantastic random forest. This is all 20 years of data set. I remember, um, I mean, all, all airline 20 years data set. Um, and I think this probably finished in like a split second. We didn't rerun it. But um, Random Forest is, I mean, it taught us a lot. So uh, if anything, it, it, it was the first algo we built. 
and it took two months, it extracted its cost, but the core platform has gotten so much better. Well, while he's running this, I'll say, if you want to build something like, the, uh, like this platform, what is the hardest problem ever? The hardest problem is parsing the data. If you can, so in Java, the joke was, if you can run Hello World, you have implemented Java. Here, if you can parse distributed, uncompressed, from S3, do, uh, you know, on, on the fly in memory compression, you're good. Everything else is easy. It's no different from your day-to-day -day life where one thing is like the 98% or 80% of data science. Um, so, yeah, so this, I mean, we, we have a pretty very good, uh, robust roadmap, um, actually. Um, GBM is coming up. We, are, I mean, we have a very good GLM, thanks to Rob and Trevor. Um, put up the roadmap here. Um, but this roadmap is a, a function of the number of users who have asked us things. So this is not a static PowerPoint. We actually took input from customers, end users, and community. And no product is complete without the community. And especially in the open source, we, we want you guys to chime in on what you need. If GBM is your next big um, problem, we're going to pick that up. Or if working machines has come up. But we pick what we have is on the leftmost corner, we actually have Random Forest ADMM, which is uh, the latest technique from Stanford uh, that gives us ways to do um, this. There's a fantastic talk tomorrow on, on some of that stuff. And next week and, and the week after, but we really are looking to the community to chime in on what they really want to do with the platform. It's 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 a first step. We have some big algos, but we want to make sure it actually does solve some real world problems. Here's uh, the 20 year uh, airline data set predicting airlines um, like more than 98 percent. Um, thinking maybe there's a couple of more columns to ignore, which will make them even better. But random forest definitely goes after some really, the more data you have, the better it gets. So in that sense, with data and random forest are actually a match made in heaven. Um, and um, and so, so if the system can scale, you guys have a fantastic powerful tool to go, go back to, not just to Kaggle, but to take back to your own um, implementations into your own day to day and make a fantastic impact. But, um, so one, one more um, case in point, um, point I want to bring up, this is not the end of the random forest at the beginning. It's kind of useful, but you need the uh, people talk about variable importance that comes up, so that's right, right there on our roadmap. People want um, regression scar trees, and that's a fantastic uh, request. Um, so just this roadmap pieces, people who are capable can contribute or just chime on issues on things that you want and you want to make sure, uh, even if Jan is going back on sabbatical, he's his, uh, his, some of his students are really building some of the core gut VMs of Safari and other fantastic things that you're using. So he, he's, he's a prolific producer of great engineers. So thanks, Jan, and thank you for coming. If you have any further questions, feel free to email us.